Finnovate showcases cutting-edge banking and financial technology through a global conference series featuring short-form demos and thought leadership. Now, the conversation continues on the Finnovate podcast. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Finnovate podcast. We're continuing our conversations with the best of show winners from Finnovate Europe 2022. And joining me today, we have Hal Lona, CTO of Truly You, one of our trophy winners. Hal, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Greg. Great to be with you. Excellent. So I've mentioned this a couple of times over the past couple of weeks, but all of the videos from Finnovate Europe are available at Finnovate.com and on our YouTube channel. You can check out Truly You's best of show winning demo there. But for people who haven't seen it yet, how can you start by just giving us a quick overview of what Truly You is all about? Yeah, I would love to. So um, Truly You is, is really on a mission to build the world's most complete end-to-end -end identity platform. And I lead up the technology effort at Truly You, so I, I probably have the most fun job. We're making great progress these days. And I think uh, partly, you know, what we showed at our in our demo at Finnovate was um uh, you know, came out of our re recent acquisition of HelloFlow, uh, which is an orchestration platform and now is available um, as uh, a capability within the global gateway platform at TruliU. So um, I personally have a lot of experience uh, before TruliU in the cybersecurity industry, which has some very interesting parallels to identity verification. So um, that's a, a little bit about us. Excellent. Now, I mean, we at Finnovate, and if you've been coming to Finnovate, you've probably been aware of TrueU for a little while now. Um, this is a company that's been focusing on identity verification for some years. This time, you know, you showed us something a little bit different. You you talked us through kind of business identity verification, um, and so I think that's one of those pieces which is a little bit different. We'll talk about that in a minute. But can you start by just talking through some of the basics around identity verification, the pieces that are challenging? You know, we see a a lot more tools being available to people like yourselves, but the bad actors kind of have access to a lot more tools as well. Where are we with ID verification at the moment? Yeah, it's very challenging. And especially when you look at the, look at it as a global problem. So, uh, you know, every geography, every region has a, a little bit of a twist. And when you think about things like, uh, you know, people may not even have consistent addresses in some countries and and uh, or, or may not have a track record with a financial institution or a utility like we do other places. So when you think about uh, just identity verification, it, it's very, very difficult and made uh, much more complicated if you uh, operate in a lot of countries or or incorporate a lot of data sources. So, um, you know, and, and then to take all that and simplify it for your customers so that they have a uniform, easy to operate interface to get at the information, all that presents, you know, quite a challenge for someone like us. Yeah, well, certainly. I mean, corralling the information, collecting it is its own challenge. What about the bad actors in the space and some of the advantages that they have? Because as much as the tech continues to advance and help you out, it certainly helps out some of the other folks as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the bad guys innovate, at least at the pace that we do, and unfortunately, sometimes faster. But, you know, we see a lot of activity with, with fraud and, and uh, you know, bad actors. And, and uh, you know, in, in the past, we saw a lot of uh, identity theft and and uh, impersonation. N now we see some really new and innovative things like bad actors creating um, accounts with uh, public facing websites like um, like vacation rentals and and uh, storefronts. So that you know when you go to look at them, you think like oh, oh that must be a legitimate person because they're they're renting out their their home you know on a vacation rental or something. But they, they figured out that's a way to score higher in some of these uh, reputation factors that. Um, you know, that the fraud assessors take into account. So um, they're, they're just constantly uh, innovating too. And, and uh, you, you know, yet another thing to watch out for. Yeah, well, certainly this is kind of a common thread when it comes to security in the financial space. There are always going to be people. There's just so much at stake. There are going to be people who are really trying to get into it. Now, let's turn and talk more towards the business side of things, because this is obviously something that resonated really strongly with our audience. They see the scope of the problem that you're trying to solve here. Can you talk a little bit about some of the differences, You know, how the process changes when you're looking at verifying a business versus an individual identity? Yeah, tr tracking down businesses it, it presents some really unique challenges, and we've seen some some um, you know very you know you would think sort of easy things like uh, more blocking and tackling, just some very you know problem problems that are much more sophisticated. On what you would think would be the easy side, 
you know, uh, the, the easiest way to track down a business is with its business registration number. And, and yet, when you look at that, there's a lot of format differences, country to country and, and data source to data source, with things as simple as, as the format of like, do they expect leading zeros or where do they expect the dashes in the number? And, and just those minor variations can produce a lot of headaches. Um, to, to go look up a business. So, you know, you, you need someone that can can take that out and, and make that easy for you and, and know sort of what the data sources are, are expecting. And then just the way businesses are registered, registered country to country means that there's a lot of different kinds of data. It's in a lot of different formats. So when you gather that data and return it back, uh, it's quite a challenge to make it uniform, you know, to the to the to our customers who want to consume it. So it, it takes a lot of sophistication to do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Would you say that it's easier necessarily? I mean, is that a fair question? We can put easier in quotation marks. Is it easier to verify a business than an individual or are they just kind of two different animals completely? I, I would say two different animals. I mean, you know, if you're in an easy jurisdiction, it might be easier. If you're in a difficult one, it may be very difficult or almost sure. impossible. So, yeah. And then, you know, the expectation now that, you know, our customers want to see inside the business and see who the owners are behind the business actually presents a whole new, you know, level of difficulty. You're almost like, you know, you, you get business verification and then often the expectation is that you're doing uh, individual verification like immediately afterwards or right alongside. So, so very difficult, you know, to, to kind of put those two problems together. Yeah. Well, I think one of the other things that you stressed when you were on stage in London was that it's not enough to just kind of verify the business. You also have to verify the human side of it as well, because ultimately, you know, when a business is comprised of people, people can be good actors or bad actors. They can do things like you were talking about, like create a, a business that's essentially a fraudulent business. But ultimately, you know, you're going to trace the business back to an individual at some point there. And, and I think that's where, it, you know, from my perspective, it kind of seems like verifying a business automatically includes a little bit of this personal verification as well. Is that a fair statement? I mean, is it kind of this you know, one and type of situation? Yeah, yeah, for sure. You're, you're exactly right. So, so the expectation is that not, not only the business entity, but the people behind it, because you want to make sure you're not doing business with a, a money launderer or someone financing terror, right? And, and I think, you know, we've had events recently like the Pandora Papers, right, that have really shown a, shines a light on, on, you know, that, and, you know, not, not that that's kind of the, exactly the same apples to apples, but it does make people realize that understanding the people behind the businesses are, are so important and that, and that sometimes people are, are kind of hiding behind a business or don't want to be discovered behind a business. And so the challenge of finding that information and presenting it is, is something we get asked for all the time. Yeah, no, I can only imagine. So I'm always a little bit hesitant to ask this next question because sometimes it can lead to really terrifying places. But, you know, you, you spoke a little bit about this, some of the things that you're on the lookout for. But what are the potential problems, you know, not in addition to just kind of being able to figure out who is who, but what are some of the potential problems that you're really looking for when you're verifying a business? Why is this something that, you know, banks are really interested in pursuing? You could see them voting for this. This is clearly a pain point. Where does that pain point come from for that? Yeah, I, I think you know one is just the the formats and the kind of the the blocking and tackling. Another are those different uh, when you look at different sources of data. There, there's different data that's available, and so you we all want it to be uniform and, and nice and even, but it's not. So it's it's a it's a messy business. Uh, and and then third, you know the fact that you typically want to put these processes together. So you, you want to find the business and the people, and then you want to identify the people. So it just it just naturally leads you you know to have to build some kind of a process there and it's not a it's not a one size fits all process if there's if there's people you want to identify them there may be varying numbers of people there may be uh, situations like um you know i may decide that only shareholders above a certain percent uh, are are kind of persons of interest for that business so there's all this kind of inherent logic to it behind the scenes that people want to put in place that just makes it you know very complex to go track down 
Yeah, well, and certainly the banks are under an immense amount of pressure to be able to provide all this information. There's no shortage of potential you know, places that people could be behaving poorly. Some of them are more mundane. Some of them can actually get you know, pretty dramatic pretty quickly. And so you, know, you can tell this is something that a lot of the financial institutions are really focusing on, really working on, and they're getting that push from their own internal moral compass and also from the external regulators. There's a lot that they have to be aware of and that they're going to be held responsible for too. So certainly um, you know, there's there's quite a bit of help that they need. I'd like to switch a little bit, kind of zoom out and talk big picture here, because you know, as we talked about, Trulio has been in the identity verification business for a little while now. You know, If you look at the last 10 years and look at how much the industry has changed in the last decade, it's, it's an immense progress. At the same time, there's this kind of feeling right now that maybe the next 10 years are going to be even more transformative. What does the future of identity verification look like? What are you guys seeing at Truly You and thinking maybe five years, 10 years from now, how different could this actually be? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And, and I, I like to think of this kind of thing as being in a, you know, where are we at in, in, in sort of the digital transformation, right, that, that we've in. And we've all been talking about this digital transformation for years, going going back years, right? And, and I think my observation is that uh, technical progression doesn't happen, you know, smoothly or at the same rate all the time. And I think what we've experienced in the last two or three years is almost like a slingshot effect, in part fueled by the global pandemic that's leapt us forward maybe 10 years in, in progress. So businesses that were kind of just planning to go digital before have now been forced to go digital and they've done it very, very rapidly, which is great, right? We, we love to see the progress, but we're also seeing things like companies that haven't really embraced or gone digital are now facing really uh, stiff competition from uh, those that have. And then also, I think there's a lot of new entrants that have come in. So these very young, nimble companies come into your space and, and they're digital from the outset. So they're able to you know, just, just do things much faster and they look at the world differently. So I, I, I just think we're in a very interesting time and it hasn't stopped. It's just, it's just moving along and we're somewhere in the middle of that. So yeah, I think when we look out to the future, we're seeing that, you know, this, this evolution that's happening and we're, we're right in the middle of it. I, I think if you look at that and say, okay, what does it mean to be a digital, you know, global digital business? To, to me, the biggest single effect is that your, um, your customers are now not limited to, you know, your, your city or, or your country, but, but really there's no borders to your business anymore. So you can attract uh, customers from anywhere and, and, and really think about, you know, the, the, uh, the opportunity for your business is, is now may, maybe much bigger than you, you ever imagined. However, there's also uh, these additional layers of complexity. And, and one of the most, uh, you know, difficult layers for a lot of people is, is verifying users and verifying the businesses you're doing business with. So, you know, that gets much more complicated when you look globally and, and just, just much harder to deal with, especially against the backdrop of the regulatory environment and the compliance environment that's evolving so rapidly. So I, I, I agree with you. I think we're at a very interesting time that's just accelerating change and, and seeing how it's going to pan out are, are, I think, very interesting. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, your, your point is a good one. There are going to be massive opportunities here for the people who are able to take care of that or take advantage of them. But in order to do that, you have to take care of some business at home first. You have to put yourself in a position to be able to go out and get that in a safe way, in a compliant way. Um, I am curious, something that you kind of brought up a couple of times is the difficulty of taking data from a variety of sources and kind of making it standard. Is there at any point in the future, do you see it coming some sort of you know global standard, some idea that we can start to organize this information in the same way to make it easier for companies like yourselves to parse it through? Or is that still kind of a pipe dream at this point? I think I think us techies all hope that there is that future, right? We, we all like to think of it as as this kind of nirvana where, you know, we, we would all have a, a digital identity. It would all be uniform. Uh, it would all be global in nature. The, the, the downside of that, or maybe the friction against that are, you know, there's competing forces that sort of want to own our identity. Uh, well, you know, one of them is governments who want to have their citizens be identified, you know, for, for tax reasons or uh, passport reasons or driver's license reasons or whatever the reasons may be, governments play a part there. There's also private companies that operate that, that want to control um, our, our identity, you know, uh, you, you know, banks and utilities and others actually have an aspect of our identity with them. And, and, and so, 
you know, and then there's this idea about self-sovereign identity where we actually would control our own identity. And, and maybe that's the technologist's nirvana. But but uh, in, in any case, I think there's these competing forces and predicting how it's going to play out is, is cor- of course, critical and, and sort of keeping our options open um, to, f- to figure out how we're going to interoperate in the meantime is, is also really important. So, I, I you know, I, I hesitate to predict how it's going to pan out. Uh, it, it, it probably will be messier and longer than us technologists would like. But but I think uh, I think those are the competing forces at play. I think that's the case. I think it's always messier and longer than the technologists would like, isn't it? Regardless of the process. But it is an interesting idea. And you can see already kind of what the potential benefits of something like that would be if it does come to pass. Um, I'd like to end with uh, just some advice for our listeners. You know, obviously, this is an area in which you're a real expert. What advice do you have for the folks on either the banking or the kind of fintech side, these new up and coming startups? What should they be thinking about early on in the process around identity verification and and how does that incorporate or potentially affect their long-term development strategies? Yeah, it's a great question. And I I believe it's a really important aspect of your business to get right. So, you know, what's more critical than onboarding new new users or new businesses to your your company? That's the most critical thing any of us are doing to grow our business. So getting it right is critical. we hear a lot of horror stories from our customers who tried to maybe go go on their own and develop it themselves, and then realize just how complicated it is. And then they go, you know, seek help after what might have been a rough start. So there's all this this aspect of sweating the details to validate users with with just the right user interface that looks like your company is authentic to you and your brand, and your and then getting the process and flow right to provide j- just the right amount of friction, but not too much because None of us want to spook away a user uh, because we maybe were a little too invasive with our questions or tried to gather a little too much data. So there, there's just a really, uh, I think, sophisticated process that goes in here to get that to get that all right. Um, you know, then I I think maybe the final point I make about that, you know, is that it's super difficult, as we all know, to hire uh, great engineers and great user interface people and you know cloud engineers and mobile engineers to get all this right. So, you know, if you can figure out a way to partner with somebody else to do some of that heavy lifting for you, who's been through it before, um, it, it, it saves you a lot of time. You get to market faster and, and overall it's, it's pr- probably beneficial to your business. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a delicate balance to be sure. And it's, you're reminded of kind of the old adage that the only thing uh, worse than having customers is having no customers, right? The, the idea, if you're going to have customers, you have to go through this process. You have to be well set up. And the sooner you start incorporating that into your model, the easier it's going to be to build from that and to get that sustainable growth. So um, obviously companies like Trulio are, are here to help. It's a major issue. It's going to continue to be a major issue for the foreseeable future future. Um, Hal, thank you so much for joining me. Again, you can find the video on Finnovate.com or the Finnovate YouTube channel. And it's been an absolute pleasure getting your thoughts today. You too, Greg. Thanks for having me on and uh, appreciate spending the time with you. Thanks. The Finnovate podcast is produced by Informa Connect in association with Provoke.fm Media. Check out Finnovate.com for information on Finnovate's upcoming shows and to learn how you can get involved. The discount code Finnovate Podcast will save you 20% on tickets to all of our events. And you can email us at info at for information on sponsoring, speaking, or demoing. Thanks for listening. <laughs>